Sometimes it's like a comedy scene. So it's like a comedy makeout when you're just like trying to make it funny. But and do you like actually kiss? Top. Like oh. tongues are involved. It depends. So do people yes. eat a mint first? Yeah. Before they kiss? Yes. Oh, yes. Good. Um, Have you ever had to kiss speaking. somebody you didn't want to kiss? Of course. Yeah. Courtney, that's the job. Yeah. 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 Follow me yeah. that kind of yeah. oh. Under all is the land, the real, real of real estate. Yeah. Courtney, your friends about to show you how to generate wealth. Well, get educated. Do for yourself. Yeah. Add a couple notches to your belt. Yeah. Under yeah. all is the land. Yeah. Under yeah. all is the land. Yeah. The real, real of Under real all is the land. Yeah. Under yeah. all is the land. Yeah. Welcome to another fantastic episode of Under All is the Land. I'm your host, Courtney Polis, here with my rock star co-stars, Desperately Seeking Silka. Hi. <laughs> and the ethical agent. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we're excited to have our special guest here. We're going to bring her on in a minute, but just to get the ball rolling, uh, we had a little conversation earlier this week about how people talk to their agents. And I'm like, I wonder if the general public has been advised of the way that they sometimes come off, or even agent to agent. We've touched on this in previous podcasts, but like this morning I got a phone call from somebody who called on one of our listings, an unrepresented buyer, I guess, um, which, you know, was a weird way to start the morning. It was like this super direct sort of um, interrogation and when I asked him if he had an agent, because the property that he was interested in is like an hour outside of LA. And so, you know, if, if there's an agent involved, the agent would be the one that, the you know, buyer's agent would go and take him into the property. And he was like, as I said, I'm not in the market and I'm, I, I don't have a house to sell. And I was like, okay, hold on a second. You know, I didn't even ask you that. But I'm like, are, are the public just really afraid of being sold by real estate agents? Is that what it is? Like, you just don't want it. But you, yet you want me to potentially drive an hour and a half to show you a property when you're not in the market. Like, what are you afraid of here? I think there's a lot of real estate agents that are sort of like piranhas that are chasing people and calling people, like almost like car salesmen. When you walk mm. to the lot, like you have immediately five people you know, come towards right, you. Right, right. And I think that that attitude that some of the agents have that they are salesy and represent themselves as being car salesy, salesy. Mm. a lot of people feel like um no i i don't want to deal with agents i don't want to talk to agents if i give them too much information they keep calling and won't let me be so there is that thing i feel like that happens that a lot might, that yeah maybe Which is but not, i'm like what can we do as right. an industry to set like, do I have to just say, like, listen, dude, I don't really appreciate the way that you're talking to me. Like, I'm a professional. I know a lot about things and I'm happy to help you, but I'm, I'm not so desperately hungry that I'm your biatch. Yeah, you should. You <laughs> I, should. Don't you, treat you, me like no, your biatch. You should think, say that. You're... Just, yeah, just be like, hey, listen, um, I'm not asking you if you have a house to sell. Frankly, I'm not really liking the way you're speaking my dear, to me right, right now. Give a damn. <laughs> Frankly. <laughs> I do not want to be treated like don't speak to me this way. Right. And um, what, how can see, I help you? Like, what just, do you really? Why are you calling? Right. Exactly. Well, like, what I, is I this? think your energy is what, yes. like, like you, you know, like the the individual agent's energy is what tells the buyer or the seller that you know, mm. like, I don't necessarily have to say to people, I don't need your business. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> but. But I'm happy to, you know, like, like act in a way that is not desperate because mm -hmm. I'm not desperate for your business. Right. If you're not going to treat me well, I'm not going to work with you. Right. And, and that's it. Yeah, period. That's, that's it. it. It's kind of like what Walker Noble said on the previous podcast, like not all money is good money. Right. right. And I do think it's okay to admit you're at a certain point in your career as a real estate agent where you've been doing it for a decade or whatever, and you are no longer, um, you no longer have to put up with being treated a particular type of way. I remember when I first got started in real estate, I was very eager, ambitious, and you know, I needed to learn a lot. So I was more than willing to kind of run errands and do the most and 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 whatever. But at a certain point, even when people call me, I'm like, you know, you should at least know who you're talking to. Yeah. Like before I call people, I Google them. I'd like to know, and I know you do this too, so it looks up on HomeSnap how many deals they've closed before like 
before we advise our clients on what agents are writing offers, it's like, is this person experienced? Do they know how to close a deal? Like all that stuff really does matter, but just doing a little bit of due diligence can at least, um, establish some level of respect. You know, I just, I don't know. I feel like, um, I feel like the public needs to understand that there are levels, just like in any career, to real estate experience and, and esteem. And those of us who have made it through our rookie years and are now at a different place in our career um, are more like partners and consultants for our clients. Yeah, True. See, but that's the thing. That's the thing is that I think that people misconstrue what a, what a real estate agent really is and what our like part in your like purchase really is you know so i think there are some people who come into this thinking and maybe they've experienced other agents like the ones who are super eager and they're like oh do you want me to open this door for you i have no buyer rep agreement but i'll just open every door that you want me to open on my saturday from <laughs> nine to five you know or whatever <laughs> like you know that they might deal with that so then the next person they ring they think they're going to get that energy but if you have mm -hmm. someone who is someone who's been in this business who's done you know who's done it for a while who has experience and you know knows like bullshit and people who are not bullshitting you know and uh you know and and just have built that respect that i think comes with mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. in this for themselves i mean yeah you know i think then they meet that opposition and then they realize what a consultant really is and we're right. not just someone who's there on your you know at, at a whim whenever you need us We'll set up a time to meet. We'll discuss what you need, and then we'll help you. Yeah, with whatever it's your own you boundaries. Need. You have yeah. to set your own boundaries. Yeah, you have to. You yeah. have to for sure. You know, I went uh, on uh, on a property that I've listed in Echo Park. We had a buyer who reached out, and she wanted tax advice. She wanted legal advice. You know, and we're like, sorry, you know, you're gonna have to speak to an accountant about that or a consultant attorney. And she lost her shit. Mm. She lost her shit. Yeah, she thought that, you know, she's like, as an advisor, I would expect that someone would, Ooh, you know, nice. give me this information. I'm like, hold on, <laughs> you know, I can, I can give advice where I have specialty, but I am not a licensed accountant. I am not a lawyer. So right. I can't consult you on those things. And if I do, I can lose my license, mm -hmm. right. you know? And so I have to set that boundary. There are some people who with that attitude might have fallen to her anger and actually advised, mm -hmm. even if it was ill advice, mm -hmm. right? You know, just out of the pressure. That's mm -hmm. a really good point. I do mm -hmm. think a lot of mm -hmm. agents get asked questions. I, the public doesn't know what we can and can't speak on, but we know mm -hmm. right. what we can and can't speak on. And because of that desire to please or that desire to like always have an answer for something, a lot of baloney tumbles out of their mouth, you know? And then it, if it's not true, you're on the hook, agent. Mm -hmm. So, like, for sure, I think as a rule, people need to know what it is our job actually is. Like mm -hmm. we're contract specialists, transaction mm -hmm. managers, but also um, just be you know respectful. be respectful. Yeah, be respectful. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, we're here to do a job. You know, I would hope that you wouldn't walk into most places and attack people who are doing their jobs. You know, yeah. we're here to help you. Yeah. And it's a big, I mean, I mean, if you have an agent who's an experienced agent who knows what they're doing, the help is, it's priceless. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it could keep you from making huge mistakes in your transactions. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I also us. had a situation this week with not one of my deals, but another deal where, where um, basically the buyer's agent on the other side didn't understand the contract. And this is not a big brokerage, okay? Didn't understand the contract when it comes to the walkthrough. And actually, I guess had advised her client that it was okay to hold funds um, and wait until the sellers had moved their belongings out before allowing the loan to fund, causing a delay. What? So I'm like, we need to get the broker involved, of course. My um, agent, our agent, cited the walkthrough paragraph of the contract, the contract that we read that our clients trust us to know. And the broker's response was like, um, I don't think agents should be giving legal advice. And I had this like long response written like, well, if you don't think your agents need to know the legal implications of the contract, then they're in the wrong business. And frankly, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Your client's in breach. My attorney's going to be involved. We'll see you in court. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> The court I, I, say it. I had it all written out. You know? I was like, ready to go. And I thought, okay, let me just wait for a second. I just made a phone call to the agent. And I said, why don't you try this? 
Like, let's give a little, like, hold back and see if that works to allay her conf- their fears or whatever. And it did. And the deal funded. So I never had to send the email. But, but and it's it nice was also, to write it sometimes. It, it felt okay to write it, for <laughs> sure. But I thought, wow, you know, do you not, as a broker, even expect that your agents understand the contract when they're giving advice that could have legal implications? Like, we're a week past closing. Mm. Our sellers could you know, send over the demand to close and cancel the deal and and nobody wins. Right. Mm -hmm. So I feel like also, you know, when it comes to respect, brokers need to respect each other too and realize our job here is to support our agents in doing their job, not to have a dick size competition with me. And I'm not the best one to have a dick size competition with. I mean, just (laughs) generally. You've got a huge dick. For sure not. (laughs) Kind of large. (laughs) You will lose that competition. I'm not afraid to go head to head on things like that. Like I, but I would never do it to the detriment of the deal or right. our clients or whatever. Sometimes but, you have to do it. You know, but, sometimes yeah. it takes that to make people perform. You know what? We mm-hmm. need to have like a, a meeting of all the brokers in Los Angeles who are meeting selling the minds. A, 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 like a meeting where we get mm-hmm. to actually talk to each other and humanize each other. Because by the time it gets to broker level conflict, it's usually like everybody's got their guards up and everybody wants to, you know, pull out their sword sure. or whatever. And yeah. I feel like if you if you know the people or you can humanize the people, you know you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you, you it would probably work to the benefit of our agents. Maybe we'll put something like that together. Who knows? Who knows? But anyway, yeah. So the PSA here is make sure you know who you're talking to. Treat real estate agents with respect, members of the general public, and we ourselves need to treat each other with some respect too, you know, no matter what stage of the game our agents are at, because some people really don't know things and you rely, you kind of like learn from the cooperating agents sometimes, like, you know, sometimes the listing agent has a lesson to teach you too, you know, and it's okay to be in that space of learning, to be um, the best agent you can be. Anything you want to add? <laughs> No, no. No, Okay. We have a really awesome guest today, Lennon Parham, an Acme client, an esteemed actress, one of the funniest ladies I've ever met in my life. And I'm excited to have her on the show to talk all things life, real estate, entertainment industry, and the jam. Welcome, Lennon. Woo! Let's introduce you to the audience in case they are one of the four people who don't know who you are. Yes. Um... (laughs) Lennon, go ahead. Oh, I'm telling you, them. Yeah, okay, tell the sure. Uh, my name is Lennon Parham. I'm a TV, film, actor, producer, director, writer, um, client of Acme, Courtney, um, the only real, real estate agent I've ever worked with. <laughs> I'll take it. You're Cole. lucky. <laughs> You're lucky. Um, yeah, I li- live in LA with my husband and two kids. We live in Highland Park and we love it. And yeah. What else is there to know? <laughs> well, I mean, you've you've done a lot of huge TV shows sure. and films. What's your what was your favorite role? Um, well, uh, the one I'm doing right now, we're f- we're filming currently filming season two of a show called Minx, which is on HBO Max, which is about um, the first ever adult magazine for women, and it's set in 1972 slash three. The first season featured a lot of uh, dicks. I know we've already covered that. Um, <laughs> like real, like about time that we see that represented on screen, right? Totally. Um, and I play this. I play a Pasadena housewife who is the sister to the editor, the the woman who wants to like make this Gloria Steinem like magazine. And I am encouraging her to go for this partnership with this porn producer because nobody else wants to make her. Her feminist, her feminist rag. rag, exactly. So, um, yeah. So that that role has been really juicy, <laughs> <laughs> really in a lot of ways. Um, and How did it come about? I just auditioned for it. I read the script. It was the funniest thing I had read in a really long time. It was a, just a pilot at that point, which is just the first episode. Um, and the part was just a. It was kind of a just a housewife. Um, I didn't know where it was going to go. So that was exciting when we got into the season and she was like, oh, so FYI, (laughs) your character's going to go quite a roller coaster. Um, So that's been really fun to play. Um, Do you get to improv when you're shooting this? uh, I mean, yeah, to some extent. Um, You know, as I usually try to, having been on the writing side of it, I, I usually try to like 
give them what's scripted as is and then either like button it with like a funny quip or sometimes on the very last take I'll do like a you know put my own sauce mm-hmm. on it or whatever but do you um, come from an improv background I do I do yes right. I well I I went to theater school. Of course she did. Um, And then I went to New York and I did Second City there. And then I did um, the Upright Citizens Brigade, which is the the theater that Amy Poehler started with uh, Matt Walsh, Matt Besser, and Ian Roberts. And so I performed like improv comedy, sketch comedy for many years, taught it, then came out here, continued to teach it. um, And I wrote uh, the the two shows that I EP'd and wrote. Uh, were, were kind of came from improv. So my writing partner, Jessica St. Clair, and I both are from the UCB and we speak the same vocabulary. We cast almost exclusively people from the UCB because we knew they were going to make us look great, basically, when they arrived. <laughs> so on those shows, um, like that's one of my favorite ones, right? Playing House. Playing House. I love that show so yeah. much. So on that show, did you guys improv? Because that's what you do? Well, we improvise to write. So we like okay, break the gotcha. story with the writer's room. We come up with the plot, how it's going to all go down. And Jess and I in the room with the writer will then improv all the scenes. We record ourselves on GarageBand. It's very advanced. It takes, <laughs> it takes forever. Then we'll rewrite it kind of on on its feet, improvising even more. Um, and that's how we do our drafts, essentially. Okay, got it. And then if we're writing it, then we take it and it gets transcribed into like a rough draft. And then we go through, circle the things that we liked, how we got into it, how we said it. Because when you're improvising, you kind of, you say weird shit in a weird way. And like, it needs it's to not be the way that you would like type it out. You right, know what I mean? Right. But we really like, wanted to capture the way that like best friends overlap and finish each other's sentences and um, have turns of phrases that don't make sense to anybody, you know, the inside joke and all of that. So um, that's how, that's how we write. And we still write that way. Like we just finished a script um, that we're taking out uh, and that's, it's, we're, we're hoping to star in it with two other funny uh, comedian ladies um, and so that's how we wrote that as well. We would break the whole story and then we would record ourselves on GarageBand over Zoom. And then we would we, um, get it transcribed and then go through it and then build the scene so from there. It's not as easy as it looks. It takes a long, long time, but it, like we feel like it kind of gives, gives us access to like a real dialogue, a real conversation. Because that's the fun part, yeah. right? I, I remember when I was in acting school. I don't yeah. know if you remember that back in one of my many lives. I used sure, to be an actor. Sure. The acting school part where there was improv, it wasn't comedic always, but it was like, you know, yeah. th- that would made me feel so alive and yes. I was so in the, the moment totally. and out of my mind and in my body and the character. Yeah, and you get whatever. out of your own way. So fun and you feel really connected. Yeah. But the real world of acting is not like that. It's like no. commercials and rejections and, you know, things that don't have, you don't, one time I did a commercial audition. Yeah. I was like deeply into Meisner in the moment. Oh, and wow. I had to create this, I created this story, like this heavy story. I was supposed to be like a sad girl on a bus. Okay. Sure, I think that sure. was the character. Yeah. And I went deeply in and I created this like death in the family. I was like crying and I was such mm-hmm, a sad mm-hmm. girl. I was the saddest of all possible girls <laughs> to the point that when I walked out, the casting associate who was <clears throat> doing the recording came out and put her arm around me and said, are you okay? Oh shit. And I was like, yeah, I was just acting. And I realized I really overacted that one. I'm like, this, you know, whatever. It and can so get did deep. you get that skills I did commercial? Not. I did not get that. Okay. No. Got it. No. Nope. They need a less sad girl. Less sad girl. I mean, Mildly sad. Too intense. Too intense. Like, too you get, you commercial get, sad. You access yes. to all these things. But in the real world, like, you can't. So if if, if you're, I, I don't know, I'm just making this up. So you did, like, a, an award-winning performance there. Yeah, like that an Oscar. Fucking, that would have been, that was, yeah. been the Oscar-winning moment. Yes. Yeah. Somebody they has like, tape of that somewhere. Intense. Yeah. Yes. In addition to, I was telling Nick about the one time I auditioned for, I'm sure you have a million audition stories too, which I'd love to hear, but I'll just wrap it with this one. I auditioned for one of Sir Mix-a-Lot's all girl groups. They wanted like a, a blonde okay. chick. I wasn't blonde. Right. So I had to wear a wig and we had to dance and sing okay. on tape. So we're like doing these hip hop dances. This is in ni- 1998. Okay. Yeah. So like hip hop, you know, but I've got a wig on, but right. I don't have it glued on. It's right. just like a wig <laughs> cap. It flies off. Oh, 
way off. And it's so ridi- funny. Like, I'm like, and hip flip, and wig flies off, right. and I'm a mess, and I don't know how to handle that or recover. It was you were so just funny. ahead of your time because, just, like, now it's you're you were just snatched. Yeah. That's what they say. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that that's what in the me. drag world. Yeah, you just snatch your wig off. You love it so much. Ooh. Your just wig flies oh. right off. All right. And in the drag world too, there's like all these gags with like wigs on top of wigs on top of wigs. Like it's a whole thing. So ah, I just think you were really ahead of your time, yes, Courtney. <laughs> she was. <laughs> that's right. You were avant garde. Your only mistake was not having a wig under the wig. Mm-hmm. That that's it. Mm-hmm. I did not layer the wigs properly. Damn. And then okay. what? Uh, what I would have been. You know what? I yeah, you could have been Danity Kane. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> Could you have ever been Danity Kane? I loved that. Making of the band. Do you remember so that? Oh yes. my God. Okay. So I, I did watch every episode of that, of the forming of Danity Kane. And then when they came out with the, we in the club, I was all over it. I was like, <laughs> this is, I don't know. It was so manufactured. Right. They're all, they were all such train wrecks in like the best of ways. And that's how I feel about America's Next Top Model. Yeah, exactly. I think I watched, I gave up on that somewhere. Yeah, I gave up on it somewhere. In the middle, too. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the last few seasons are trash. But yeah. but I at the beginning was, I was like, this is a this is a mess, but it's so such a great so well produced, like, you can't all hope. Them. Like yeah. all of these sweet souls that are just hoping that their lives are gonna change because of this. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. they sang, you know, giving him something he can feel in front of P. Diddy. Right. I don't know. It just yeah. Yeah. There's something in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hope springs eternal. Yes. You have to have a little delusion to make it in this town, that's for totally, sure. Totally, totally. Yeah. Or not know what's un- impossible. Exactly. You have to dream bigger, kind of drink your own Kool-Aid. I was just yeah. going to say that. Yeah. 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 And and know how to actually do that under pressure when there are high stakes. Yeah. Which obviously you've done very well. It's better if you don't know there are, I, there are high stakes. I did a <laughs> I did a table read. Okay, so in theater, the theater world, table reads is when you read out loud the work, right? So that the playwright or the director, whoever can hear it, it's like a workshop moment. But in television, a table read, you will get fired if you don't do a good job. Ooh. I had no idea, right? Okay. So I booked my first pilot ever, and I, I booked it in New York. I was also sick. So I was I think I was kind of like out of my own head because I, w- I was so not feeling well. And my husband was like, this is a terrible idea. And they were like, we want to, we want you to test for this role. It was this um, space comedy <laughs> written by the always sunny guys. And uh-huh. so I was like, I have to do it. It's my big break. So I flew out on like Halloween night or something to LA sick as a dog. I test the next morning. I book it. Two days later, we have the table read. I'm sitting across from the president of Fox, have no idea who he is. Next to me is Tony Hale, phenomenal actor. Uh, you know you know him from Veep and the Mysterious Benedict Society. And um, I have my hot tea, I have my Cardi. And I'm like, it's just an improv, like it feels like, I love a table read. I love a live performance. I, I feel like it. It's my element. I'm able to shine. And so I'm flipping through. I'm so cash and just, but I'm improvising and nailing it and making the moments funny. And afterwards, Tony was like, what were you doing out there? And I was like, what? And he was like, you were just like so casually like sipping your tea and like putting on your card again. They'll fire you if you don't do a good job. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> oh my what God. What do you mean? You guys, is somebody going to tell me that? And why, I, and I why was no this idea. not a good job the way you did it? I know exactly because I had no idea the high what stakes. Like, need, the but did you, get, you didn't yes. get fired. No, I didn't oh, get thank fired. Oh, God. <laughs> no, I didn't get fired. And we filmed the whole thing and it was great. And the, it didn't get picked up, but um, it was so funny. I still to this day stand by it. It's such a funny pilot. But. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was such a bizarre, then from then on out, you know, you go to table reads and you see people like who just think it's no big deal. They're phoning it in and you want to like go up to them and be like, Hey, just give so it, know. give it a hundred here. You know, right. like if you're not a series regular already, it could be, they could be kicking <laughs> you out the door, you know? Wow. So, so get your shit together. It's good advice. Get your shit together <laughs> out there, people. <laughs> good advice. How is working on Veep? Because I loved that character that you played on Veep, talking out of both sides of your mouth. She was so fun. So Um, fantastic. That was one where the, so my audition was was with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Chris Addison, who was one of the director EPs. 
And my favorite casting office, Allison Jones, who uh, casts all of your favorite things ever. Um, and she is like, she's great because she'll laugh. She'll laugh with you. And that makes, obviously, as a comedian, that's a, a game changer. Um, but yeah, we, it was like the best audition experience I've ever had. And um, it was so fun. And we improvised and we played off of each other. And I was making them laugh and they were making me laugh. And when I left, I was like, if I don't get this, like, I will have had that moment <laughs> that, that is like a golden moment. And I, I know I have done my personal best and, um, and then I, but then I did get it and, uh, I got to and killed it. go. Yeah. It was the first season I, I shot was in Baltimore. Um, and that was incredible. Uh, it felt like stepping into what I would call the comedy Olympics. Like everybody's yeah. like working at such a high frequency. They're going through pages and pages every day. Like, like sometimes 10 to 18 pages, which is crazy. Like normally on a, on a normal show, you would shoot maybe seven pages a day. So the pace is really rigorous and you're just expected to show up like ready to rock. It's like um, real pro. Very pro. Um, no fucking around. I mean, fucking around, but like within the context of the show, you know? Um, so that was really fun. And Armando, the guy who created it, Armando Iannucci, he was really supportive of me and helped me like kind of find her and settle down. And, and then at one point he was just like, you know what, just repeat everything she says like whatever she says just repeat it and nod and I was like great because I you know I had scripted lines but um but that kind of so she would be like well I agree with that and I go I agree with that you know and I would bounce my head and and it was uh, and and everybody in the cast you know was supposed to hate me so that was really fun to be hated by everybody um I wonder if that would work in real estate Oh, to just 100%. repeat and nod. It oh always, God. it definitely works. You think so? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying that next. Okay. Year. I think we should try I, that. Yeah, uh -huh. hundred thousand. Uh -huh. Yeah, hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. We're gonna try that. Yeah. That's what should. we're looking for from you today. We want tips and tricks. We have fifteen tips offers. Tips and tricks. Fifteen offers. Have you ever filmed a sex scene? I uh, yeah, I did uh, two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> How yeah, was that? No, I mean, uh, no comment. Um, <laughs> no, we, uh, yeah, I mean, I filmed like sex scenes, like make out scenes, sex scenes. Sometimes it's like a comedy scene. So it's like a comedy make out when you're just like trying to make it funny. But and, do you like, actually over the kiss? Top. Like oh. tongues are involved. It depends. So do people yes. eat a mint first? Before yeah. They kiss? Yes. Oh, yes. Good. Um, Have you ever had to kiss somebody speaking. you didn't want to kiss? Of course. Yeah. Courtney, that's the job. That's the job. <laughs> okay. Or you when you had like lots choices. of garlic at the lunch table for I us. did shoot a pilot with a gentleman. We had a very close, like hot face-to-face -face moment. And right before we shot, he was like, there's a taco truck out there. Do you mind? And I was like, yeah, go, go do your deal. Thinking like, He'll brush his teeth, he'll take a mint, he'll chew some gum before he comes in and gets right up close in my face. And so I think it was the best acting I've ever done because you would have never known <laughs> oh, <laughs> that wow. he came up with me like with that hot, hot carnitas breath. Ooh. And and I'm supposed to like pretend that I'm falling back in love with him, you know. So yeah, oh, you that, can't eat. You're like a now, little you? burp came <laughs> out first. <laughs> like yeah, sorry, exactly. the onions. Oh, no. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Yeah, no. Now there's intimacy coordinators, oh, so that's yeah. like a stunt coordinator, but for sex scenes and kiss scenes and um, you know, on Minx we have a lot of that. So right, you guys have someone, a lot of that. Yeah. So there's someone um, who has already. They're basically the liaison between the director and the EPs and the actor. So the actor can say to that person, like, you know what, I, I have a thing with my ear. Please don't touch my ear or whatever the thing is, you know, or you're like, I'll go for it as long as as long as it doesn't go. The hands don't go here or you know what I mean? Right. Mm. So um, do they yeah, take so a long time to shoot because you have to get angles right because you or not Avoid really it's not or... it's not but it's not like a stunt like a stunt you have to have a camera in a specific place because you aren't actually hitting the person right but in a in a makeout scene you are actually kissing the person but not in a sex scene 
Well, in the sex scene, so well, I heard they are or, real. That's so you no, know, yo, no, they do like. There's a whole thing now where you're like, you have on, you know, you have on your nude, whatever Modesty business, and then thingies, yeah, and then you also have a barrier usually oh. between your business and their business, and you each have the barrier. Okay, so so that's good. Yeah, yeah, it's not like the olden days. No, it was a Wild West situation in the past. <laughs> yeah. It, I don't... I what think are the barriers? What they're do you, sort what do you of mean? like... Is it like a, a foamy... It, it, it's a thing? Yeah, it's a thing. It's like... I mean, um, huh. I, there's been yoga mat. Oh. Like they cut a piece of yoga mat that's like the shape of a pad. Oh, okay. And then they... Or there'll be like a knee pad that they put over the... The, 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 the sword. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've always been curious about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like yeah. how now, how it goes, because a lot of politics have changed. I mean, even yeah. when I was acting, which was early, like late 1990s to early 2000s. Yeah. Um, there really weren't that many rules and there was nothing really woke about what was going on. And no. it was kind of like, show us your tits. Okay. You yeah. Want to roll yeah. Or not? I mean, like, I'm not comfortable with this. All right. Yeah. Get out even next, a, even you know? a movie that I shot not long ago did not have an intimacy coordinator and there was nudity and stuff like that. And thank God it wasn't me, but like there was nobody checking to see how I felt or like if I was comfortable with this. And now it's not like that at all. There's like they have like really strict rules that the assistant director is talking to the intimacy coordinator. They're in a robe until the very last minute. Then they have a closed set. Mm -hmm. Then the, mm -hmm. there are cameras not running at all of the places that the screens are running. Like they turn those to black and it's like a whole process to protect the actor. Mm -hmm. That's which good. Is, it is good. That's, that's it, how it should be. Yeah. yeah and to protect yeah. them from a lawsuit. I'm sure that's the yes. <laughs> yeah, deeper. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Thing. But you can sort of shoot around it. So like, for instance, if the shot, is your face right mm -hmm. you whatever's going on below that can be clothed can be right can be faking it right right, right but right. if it's like a wide shot you have to kind of get creative and All when in. we when we bought your house in highland park yes um you got pregnant like i was already, you already pregnant, pregnant but i didn't know it yet aha uh -huh. yeah, that's I why i you. made such a quick decision about my nest. It wasn't my, <laughs> my house. Excellent my sales skills. Also was that. No. no, that was crazy, Courtney, because, okay, so I was following your blog and that was it, right? I, we Thank had you. never spoken before, but you, you would, I loved your taste and you would post like every week listings we love. And, um, we had been window shopping, but we were not like approved or anything. And, we, I, you posted listings we love and I checked it and there was this house in Highland Park and I looked at the photographs and I was like, I think that's our house. I called my husband who was a principal of an all girl high school at the, at the time. And I said, I think I just found our house. Look at these pictures. And he was like, I love it. And so then I called the listing agent mm -hmm. who was like, I'm showing, I'm like, presenting two offers to the two offers, not 40 or whatever it is now. Right. <laughs> um, I'm presenting two offers Cute. to the seller tonight. Um, so if you want, you have to get pre-approved, come see the house and put in an offer by 5 p.m. And it was, I think at that point, like 1 p.m. So uh, I called you and I said, <laughs> I said, uh, this is the situation. Is this crazy? And you go, yes, but let's go for it. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so then it was like a matter of getting pre-approved with somebody like very quickly. And then it turned out they couldn't accept offers that night because the seller was sick or something or couldn't get the house ready to be seen in time. And so, um, we ended up seeing it the next morning at like 9am or something. I think we, that was the first time I ever met you. Mm -hmm. I mean, we literally had to talked on the phone for two seconds. Um, we put in an offer at like 10 a.m. and we owned the house at 8 p.m. <laughs> it was like, I mean, at the offer, yes. it the was best. crazy. It was cr It was fast. It was so fast and furious, but it was like, we knew, we knew deeply and we were like, and you did that really awesome thing where you were like, we can, we can offer, like we can counter and say, we'll match up to this price by in increments of five grand or something like that, which Escalation. I Escalation. Yeah, yeah, which I had never heard of. I don't think that the people who were also against us knew Did what that, was yeah, coming. Yeah, nobody was doing that at that time. Yeah, so that's what, and also we wrote a letter, but I think, I think that's what got it because we were the highest offer and then we were going to match up to whatever. 
Yeah. But it was listed for five ninety mm-hmm. in Highland Park mm-hmm. in Mount Angeles, and we got it for six thirty. Yeah, and now it's worth like a lot more, 1. a, lot, a yeah. lot more, and yeah. and and. You know, with that, you bought it at the right time, obviously. Yeah, and like we, was, I didn't even know where that was. Of course. Nobody knows where it is. We were Fine. living in it, Echo Park at oh, the time. Oh, you didn't know where the neighborhood I didn't know was. the neighborhood. Oh. It was crazy because we had been to Good Girl. Do you remember Good yeah, Girl? Yeah, Good Girl Dine? Dinette. Yeah, because mm-hmm. we had taken my husband's bike to get fixed, like, nearby, and then we'd gone to Good Girl, and I was like, oh, I like this area. And then that house came up, and I was like, where the fuck is this? And it felt, like, so far from Echo Park. But it's actually really way more convenient to live there. Um, so yeah, we and we that's really a special took little a pocket of Highland risk. Park too. Yeah, Mount Angeles is like a yes. coveted little corner yes. of Highland yeah. Park. I'm we so glad very you got your lucky. house, and you're still there, which is amazing. Yeah, but your journey has included buying additional properties yeah. and leveraging, yeah. and that's the thing. It's like it started yeah. here, and what I find also awesome because we are in a town that has a lot of people who have income similar to yours, where yeah. it really comes in based on the projects that you're doing, right? And, you know, you but you're using real estate as a like a. Not a safety like, net, but it's like a nest egg almost, or like I mean, it feels like a smart way to invest your money because, like, from year to year. I mean, when we go to when we went to get, like get our finances done for um, the house that we got in Altadena for my parents, mm-hmm. um, they were like, <laughs> the guy was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> like, because every year is so so, so different. different, you know. Um, and like one year we had a great great year because I was on a series and it was like you know, like 20 episodes of television. Um, and then one year, like I sold a script or something, you know, and right. then pandemic. So um, it's really all over the all map. Over the place. But that's the thing. A lot of people who it could benefit the most real estate buying could benefit yeah. the most yeah. are like, I, there's no way I'm going to get approved. I'm in the entertainment industry. I'm 1099. I'm, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, like makeup it's artists and stylists yeah. and like they don't, but it is possible and there are lenders who do it. Yeah. yeah. And especially here. Here. Plus yeah. it's LA, understand. So yeah. If 80% you have like, are self-employed, yeah. self-made people. Yeah. 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 If, but if you, big banks, they are you know they're a little Nervous bit tougher to, to work it. with whenever yeah. you're an entrepreneur or you have like sporadic income but local lenders who understand yeah. LA's market and the saturation yeah. of people who are just like you you know mm-hmm. or you know mm-hmm. or have sporadic income is yeah they they, they they can really pull things out of the bag right and it's like for it is an in, a little bit of an insurance plan for those breaks in your career that totally. people in the entertainment industry have there should be more people ahead of that and yeah, it's not totally. just the union, you know, it's not the union, credit union that does it, you know. Yeah. It's like there are, there are lots of options now, lots yeah. of alternative lending programs. Yeah. So you played a real estate agent? Yes, on Mad Men. I was five months pregnant um, and I booked it, which like when I got pregnant, I was like this, I guess I'm just taking a 10 month break or you know what I mean? And <laughs> plus maternity leave. But um, it actually, I, I worked a lot. Like I worked on Arrested Development. I worked uh, in Mad Men. Um, I was writing, you know, we shot uh, the pilot for Playing House when I was eight months pregnant. My character was pregnant in that show. Right. So, um, but, yeah. Okay, so how so, did you play yeah. the realtor? Like what was the... What, oh, sure, sure. Do you remember um, the character? Real uppity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. Do, it, do it, I wouldn't do no, it. No, 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 I, I can't remember what the lines were, but I was, it was, it was essentially, I'm, I was in a, you know, full hair and makeup up to like pill hat, oh, like trapeze. So cool. Yeah, multiple, I did, I had multiple scenes because I was helping Elizabeth Moss get her first big apartment. Okay. Oh, working with her, yeah. she's wonderful. Yeah, she is wonderful. Um, and she, she's class act. She came in to do her off camera lines, like in my scene where she wasn't on camera. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like so I, normally we, somebody, yeah. like just somebody from the set would like read. Yeah. So you yeah. Have she, about did own, she did her own. Yeah. But wow. she came in to do that. That's she made, cool. made sure she was available to me. But I want to really know like how, how you sounded. Like what was, how did you. It was in New York. So she was New York. Um, what was I? I was like, uh. I was like, the Upper East Side. So we've got, you know, there's going to be a new subway system or something like that. I don't remember exactly. There was a show called Bajillion Dollar Properties, which was the spoof of the Million Dollar Listing okay. show um, that my friend um, Kulap uh, created. And, and a lot we of our comedian star- friends starred in it. Yeah, it was really funny. I mean, they were all insane. I played a woman. 
like who was supposed to come in and get raccoons off the property and then I end up living with the raccoons like it was just it was just <laughs> can I say that you were accused of stealing cats oh my god I was accused of stealing cats what I'm telling you crazy <laughs> stuff happens but I sold this house and the neighbor the drunk neighbors did we not talk about this once no before? we have not oh my god so the, okay I sold the house it was a, a, the sale, the kids of the lady who owned the house. She yeah. passed. The kids, you know, yeah. west side. And I guess the lady fed cats. Okay. So okay. there were like these like stray feral cats, cats yeah. that would come around. But once we put the house on the market and they cleaned out all of the stuff and whatever, we just kept the house closed and then for showings it opened it. But so, you know, nobody was feeding the cats, the yeah. cats. And the kids were like, they'll find somewhere else to eat, you know, sure. like whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was that. So, um... I get a four o'clock in the morning drunken phone call oh, no. from the neighbor. Yeah. You stole our cats. You stole our cats. Ugh. I'm like, what? It's four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what? I, you were the real estate agent. We have a witness. And you stole the cats. And I'm like, I didn't steal any cats. I'm allergic to cats. I'm not going to steal your cat. Um, I don't know what you're talking about, but like, and then I called the seller, the daughter of the seller. I'm yeah. like, can you, if, you know, like talk to them or something she's yeah. like yeah i'll call them don't worry yelp review after yelp review this lady sold the house next door she stole our cats oh. she <laughs> stood to she got rid of the cats oh, no it gets no. worse no, three no, months no. ago i'm driving and i get a phone call from a not blocked number okay so there's yeah a phone number and this guy's like, hello, this is uh, Detective Johnson um, from the LAPD, and I'm calling with regard to these cats, these stolen cats. Are oh, you the agent that sold God. the house on Christian like so many years ago? I'm like, wait, you're a detective? No, no, and he's no. like, yes, yeah, so I need you to come down to the office and answer no, some questions. I don't think so. I was man. like, mm, I didn't steal any cats. Uh, I'm like, I'll have my people talk to your people. And he goes... You're not going to come down? Then I'm going to have to subpoena you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you even know the process? That's how it so works. So I'm like, all right, I don't believe you're a detective. I didn't steal any cats. Bye. And so I Googled the number, and it's the drunk next door neighbors again. <laughs> I'm like, damn, this has been like a couple years. And, you know, it took a while to get those Yelp reviews down. Like, they yeah. didn't, you know, I know. So accused of stealing a lamp last night from a Hollywood bar. Accused of, I'm like, I don't have enough money to buy cats if I want oh, to steal oh your God. cats. Listen. I'm not going to steal your Amazon lamp. <laughs> the hell? Do I have a face that says I steal stuff or something? Yeah, just random shit nobody wants. Accuse this lady of stealing the cat. Careful, people in oh Courtney. You've got a bright red T right there. Dude. For thief. I'm like... Uh, but you how know, was it pregnant to be on TV to circle back on that? Did what, you, like, how do they write your character? Yeah, so the, the Mad Men thing was okay because I, um, it was like the those triangle dresses, you know, that were the fashion in the 60s where they kind of like go out in a, mm-hmm. not even an A-line, even bigger. And then I had like a swing coat over it. So you never, you couldn't see. I was five months pregnant at the time. So I was really pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um for arrested development i was only nine weeks pregnant i was like barely showing but i fainted oh <laughs> i fainted on we were filming and i was really trying so hard because it was again with tony hale who i've been <laughs> through thick and thin with at this point um and it was this scene where buster is in therapy for his giant hand and <laughs> <laughs> He's supposed to have like superhuman strength and he squeezes a thing, a toothpaste and they had rigged it with special effects. So his toothpaste shoots out all over me. So it was like a stunt on top of a like insane scene. And, um, I don't, I think I had just been standing too long without snacks or whatever. And my body was very working very hard to create a human inside and nobody knew, you know, right. Mm. Cause I hadn't told anybody it was only nine weeks and I, and I just like went, I was like, I said my line. <laughs> just went, I just finished my line because I was like, I have to get through this line. I have to get through this line. I, and then I was like, I'm going down. And then I just like <laughs> fell and he caught me. And then um, the AD came in and took care of me. And it was, it was great. Oh, yeah. wow. well, Tony. We love yeah. you too. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite actor? Uh, I want to wrap with this. Who was your all-time favorite actor or the actor you've learned the most working the actor with? I've learned like, the most working with. Yeah. Um, that's tough. That's tough. I mean, I feel like I've had, I've really lucked out in that I've had some amazing partners and co-stars. 
like I, I'm a real observer, so I like when I'm on set, I'm watching kind of everybody like do their job because I've I've started directing. I directed um, this show called Somebody Somewhere this summer, and I directed a couple of Bless This Mess, which was the last show I was on before Minx. And so I just like I'm obsessed with people that do their jobs well, and everyone you know working at this level, most of them do. Mm -hmm. So I'll watch the director. I, I learned so much just by watching them talk to actors and I watch, you know, how actors work. And, um, I mean, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is a legend and an icon and, um, she is like a consummate professional, but she's also delighted by the people around her. So like she's excited for what you will bring to the process, but she loves preparation she'll, you'll rehearse it a thousand times. How is it going to go? And then if it doesn't, if it doesn't like click that way, you'll adjust it and redo it until it's right. Um, so I, w I would probably say her, um, my writing partner and scene partner, Jessica St. Clair. Also, I love performing with her. She makes me laugh harder than anybody in the whole world. Well, there's something about working with people you know really, really well. We've yeah. learned even on this podcast, this is like something we look forward to because it's an hour where we get to yeah. really engage, like, yes. you know, and you yeah. get to do that when you work with your friends. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining oh, us thanks. on Under All is the thank Land. It's such a pleasure to hear your stories. So yes, fun. Yes, thanks for having me. And we're going to be tuning in to the second season <laughs> of Minx for sure. Yeah, I don't know when. It, we're filming now, so it'll be out sometime next year, I reckon. We're here but for it. But if you haven't seen season one, go watch that. I've yes. seen season one. It's, Didn't I text you? I'm like, my son's like, yeah. Mom, we got to watch this show. And yeah. when I started to watch it, I'm like, ah, <laughs> this is for him. <laughs> He's 13, though, yeah, so maybe yeah. like the whole, like, it's anything, but you know, he's actually not that kind. I don't, I don't, I don't really know. They keep a lot away from us. The yeah. TikTok keeps us yes. on our toes. They yes. know us so much more than we think. They, they know a lot, but they don't like I, when I was younger, we had to go out to get that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it's, it's like in their phone. Mm -hmm. So I don't totally know. Yeah. You know how much, whatever. I digress. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's tomorrow next week. <laughs> we'll see you next time on under all is the land. Bye. Bye. Under all